You know, the older I get, the more I realize too many of y'all won't watch a single movie that's older than you. That's a tragedy considering most movies today are trash, but that's why I'm here. So let's rectify these crimes against God and good taste for your sake and our children's sake, because today the movie house is here to retro-recommend. I have a confession to make, something that I've struggled with for years, something that society deems completely tasteless. I, hmm, I, I like Polly Shore movies. I know, right? But the older I get, the more that I can feel nostalgic about the dumb movies of my youth because they were innocent have a new agenda greater than baseline capitalism. They entertain you for 90 to 120 minutes and you pay them for it. And yeah, I unabashedly look back at 1992's Encino Man fondly. So the plot of Encino Man is, uh, well, you know, let me let the weasel explain it. The movie's about these two loser kids from Encino and we find a caveman in his backyard. We take the caveman to school and it makes us cool. Yes, it's about as scientifically accurate as a creationist historical museum. No, I don't give a shit. Caveman plus weasel plus stupid fat Herbert makes me go laugh. Strangely enough, a movie like this is the reason why I love doing retro recommends. For as much as I, you know, I think I know a movie, I've seen it multiple times. When I research a film, just to get up to speed on it, I always learn some new tidbit or behind the scenes detail that just changes my perspective on a movie. And how this got made is almost as entertaining as the end result. History time, Les Mayfield was a successful producer on many behind the scenes promos and docs for big movies, many of which were connected to Steven Spielberg. But Mayfield wanted to be directing his own movies, so he and alongside his producing buddy, George Zolom, pitched Encino Man to the Disney-owned Hollywood Pictures. They ended up greenlining the project, but they weren't confident in Mayfield's ability to actually direct it. So to prove that he had what it took, he shot a screen test proof of concept of sorts over the span of one day, and thank the internet gods an archive of this exists. This shoot included Ben Stiller and Keith Coogan playing Link and Dave as a favor to Les Mayfield. It's bizarre seeing a scene you've watched a dozen times before with a completely different cast and a totally different chemistry. No one in the screen test was frankly right for this movie, but it did show Hollywood Pictures the project would be in competent hands with Mayfield. So now the movie needed to be cast, Easier said than done because even the filmmakers thought this was going to be dumb. This was Brendan Fraser's first leading role. At the time, he wasn't sure playing a caveman in a teen comedy would help his career, thinking he was more of like a serious actor. But he ultimately relented. Sure, he gets a few moments here where he gets to show his dramatic chops with the whole man at a time, everyone you know is long dead thing. But Encino Man was ground zero, where that little extra dash of Chemical X was added into the concoction that was Brendan Fraser and turned him into a mainline success. Dude, he's effortlessly funny. Yeah, he has those himbo good looks, but he also has the complete confidence to look absolutely silly. It's no wonder he ended the 90s a superstar with movies like The Mummy or George of the Jungle. Pauly Shore is comedy royalty of sorts. His mother, Mitzi Shore, owned the Comedy Store, the legendary LA nightclub where generations of the best stand-up comedians hung out, cut their teeth, perfected their craft, and partied like goddamn animals. Shore worked at the store and was privy to all this wild shit. He started doing stand-up himself before even finishing high school, before eventually becoming a popular VJ on MTV. So he was already a known personality, but this shot the weasel into the zeitgeist, buddy. This was his first big Hollywood film. The studio originally wanted him to play Link, but Shore felt that being one of the teens would play to his strengths better. So they rewrote the original script's Harold into Stoney, which is mainly just Shore improvising his way through the entire movie, providing much of the comedy. Said brand of Hyucks is not for everyone's taste, like, duh, and was definitely overplayed in later films. Father, when can I leave to be on my own? But when given the right role, like here, and the following year's son-in-law, he shines. You guys have chickens? Oh, I love chickens. Are they extra crispy original recipe? Stoney is spacey but sweet, guileless but not brain dead, and is the glue holding the story together. And it seems like he hit it off with Frasier after this because Frasier kept showing up in his later films for these like little single scene cameos. Rounding out this main trio is Sean Astin, the biggest name of the group at the time, who too didn't think this was going to be good and turned it down multiple times until Jeffrey Katzenberg's checkbook convinced him otherwise. <laughs> this was just a well-paying gig for him. It seems like his mood on the project did change after meeting his co-stars going, okay, this could work. But I do actually agree somewhat with Samwise the Brave's first thoughts on the project. His character Dave is the worst part of the movie. Aston, as great of an actor as he is, has the unenviable task of playing the wet blanket to Shore and Fraser's antics. As written, Dave suffers from Daniel LaRusso syndrome, where despite ostensibly being our protagonist, 
He comes across as an asshole, not even a charming one, more of that pushy, self-serving type. He does eventually change his ways, in like the last 10 minutes, so it doesn't really feel earned. Maybe with one more draft, they could have ironed out his character and ended up with a stronger film. The rest of the cast includes the likes of Megan Ward, one year away from co-starring in Alex Winter's absolutely insane, gross-out schlock masterpiece, Freaked. Then there's Rick DeCommon, Michael DeLuise, Robin Tunney, Rose McGowan, Eric Avari, a few years before he and Frasier reunited in The Mummy, and Ki Huey Kwan, which is just goddamn silly that this flick can be touted as starring two Oscar winners. When it came out, surprise to no one, Encino Man was savaged by the intelligentsia, but it didn't really matter. It ended up being a surprise hit that year, raking in like $40 million against its $7 million budget. It helped jumpstart Frasier and Shore's respective careers, and it is dumb, harmless fun. It's like a slightly edgy Disney Channel movie. Well, technically it kind of is, so take that as you will. Yes, outside of its absurd premise, it is about as bog-standard a teen comedy as it comes. I mean, shit, the only thing missing from this movie is our heroes having to raise money to save the rec center. It really is Frasier and Shore's performances that make this movie memorable. Well, that and a banging early 90s soundtrack and it being immortalized with one of the most popular gifts of all time. Though now that I know about it, I can't help but ponder long into the night that there is somewhere out there in the multiverse some insane, twisted reality where Ben Stiller and Brendan Fraser's careers were swapped. Tug Speedman in The Mummy, Rick O'Connell as Derek Zoolander, and Tony Perkins is George of the Jungle. <laughs> Look, I'm not gonna pretend that this is great cinema, but it does provide enjoyable, if boneheaded, entertainment, because in the end, Encino Man is still a decent diet movie. But that's enough for me. I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts. Comment, like, subscribe if you want. It'll help me out. But more importantly, until next time, stay safe out there.